Great to see you this morning. We're finally getting some much needed rain today, but I'm glad you're here to worship our God together. And it's great to be with you today. I am excited about our marriage seminar that is approaching now less than a month away. And I just want to remind those who would like to attend those last two evenings as couples, uh, please be sure and register to do that before those sessions are filled. I talked with Peter Ray Cole a few days ago. He said, if we don't have 20 couples, that's fine. I mean, 10, 15 is fine. I think we have about 12 couples who are registered, but we have room for 20. So if you'd like to attend, if you're married and as a couple uh, would like to attend that, you'll be sitting at the feet of someone who's very qualified to share some very helpful and practical information on uh, marriage in that workshop. When I think about the statement that was just read for us, Brother Lynn read from Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9, fire in my bones, <clears throat> I think about the power in God's Word and the inability to hold it within, to just keep it to oneself. I think you know me well enough to know that I love to preach. It has been a lifelong uh, burning aspiration and desire. I consider it a great privilege. And to think of not being able to share the gospel of Christ would, would truly be a troubling thought. Jeremiah said, I tried to hold it in. I, I tried to keep it within myself. But he couldn't do that. He says he was weary in trying to do that. In fact, looking again at the verse there, if you'll notice his wording specifically, he says, if I say I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, then there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary with forbearing, and I cannot contain it is impossible to hold it in since he was blessed with the Word of God. What about you? Do you feel that, that uh, burning desire to share the gospel with others? Since you learned the gospel of Jesus Christ, you believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that faith or belief motivated you to repent of your sins, to confess your faith, and to be baptized into Christ. You remember when you were baptized? When you came up out of that watery grave, did you not feel like you were ready to conquer the world for Christ? Did you not feel that you just couldn't wait to share it with your loved ones, your friends, your neighbors, those about whom you cared? Did you ever try not to speak when you knew that a person needed what God's Word has to offer? Was it like uh, Jeremiah says, as a fire shut up in your bones? Was it fire in your bones? Since last year, October of last year, Almost a whole year has passed since we had Brother Rob Whitaker here for the marriage, I'm sorry, for the uh, personal evangelism seminar. The personal evangelism seminar. And you remember when he came, the, uh, the excitement that he had and I think tried to transmit to each of us. You could see it in his manner of delivery. You could see it in his words and his actions. And many of us felt a renewed excitement for personal evangel evangelism. Now think about the months that have passed since then, since last October. Let me ask you personally to think about a few questions with me. Number one, since last October, how many personal Bible studies have I conducted? I'm not asking for a show of hands, obviously, no, no record here. Just think about the answer to that question in your mind. You, you do remember that Jesus said in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18, 
Go you into all the world, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And then he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Or in Mark's account, Mark chapter 16, beginning at verse 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Do we, since last October, do we have a list in our hearts of the Bible studies that we have conducted? Here's another question. How many Bible studies have I arranged for someone else to conduct? Someone might say, well, I'm, Bob, you got to understand, I'm not too good at conducting a Bible study. Okay. How many studies have I arranged that someone else would conduct? Here's another question. How much use have I made of the Personal Evangelism Resource Center? You see, after Brother Whitaker left, we set up a corner of the foyer in the church building, called it the Personal Evangelism Resource Center, the PERC, out there under the clock where the light is always on. Remember that? And all of these materials, not only from Rob Whitaker, but we added other materials that people prefer to use for conducting home Bible study. Have you visited the PERC? Have you looked through those materials? Have you taken them and tried to use them in teaching others? These are questions for self-inspection. Number four, how many souls have I led to Jesus Christ? When in the better land before the bar we stand, how deeply grieved our souls may be if any lost one there should cry in deep despair, you never mentioned him to me. How many souls have I led to Christ? And then the last question, I want you to think about this, individually and as a congregation. At this rate, at this rate, am I going to be able at the end of the line to say that I have obeyed my Lord, that I have personally evangelized the world? Have I gone into all the world, preached the gospel to every creature? Is there fire in your bones this morning? And I'm not talking about the fire of arthritis and pain that we deal with, the stiffness and the soreness that a rainy day brings. I'm not talking about that. But do we, like Jeremiah, feel within our bones this burning desire to share the gospel with other people? I would remind each of us this morning that each one of us, male and female, young and old, every member of the congregation should have that burning desire that Jeremiah was describing. <clears throat> you know the scriptures teach that every, every Christian is a soul winner. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, the wise man states a profound truth. He says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is wise. Are we winning souls? Are we convincing people through the power of God's word to live for and to serve Jesus Christ? Now, I know what some of us think right away. We tend to think that this is someone else's bailiwick. Somebody else is much better at this. I, I, I'm just not that way, Bob. You have to understand, I just can't do that. 
But may I remind you that only you have the talents that you have? Only you have the set of talents that our Lord has blessed you with. Now, talents come in many forms and fashions, many descriptions. There are thousands of talents, abilities, special skills, but only you have the set of them that God has given you. In the parable that we often call the parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25, verse 15, this statement is made. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Now watch this. To each according to his several ability. Are you a five talent person? Maybe a two talent person? Maybe you're a one talent person. Point is, only you have the talents that God has given you in combination with all of the others that you have. You know, I have known of people that had the talent for arranging Bible studies. They seem to be able to get people to come into their home on a weekly basis to sit down and open the scriptures together. That's a talent. Not everybody has that talent. I've known of other people who, when they tried to set up a Bible study, they scared people away. I sort of feel like that myself sometimes. I, nobody's going to come into my home to sit down and study the Bible. Why? Because I scared them away. But other people just had, the, the, seemed like the natural ability to put people at ease. And if it wasn't in their home, it was in the home of the, of the person who they were studying with. Or maybe the Bible study would take place in the church building somewhere. The talent to arrange Bible studies. Now, that's different from the talent to teach or conduct the Bible study. I know a lady in a congregation some miles away from here who is not a teacher of Bible studies very often. But she somehow has this remarkable, uncanny ability to get people to come to her house once a week. She also, by the way, knows how to make cookies and other refreshments. But that's, that's icing on the cake. Because these people come to her house expecting to study the Bible. And I think that's marvelous. I think that is amazing that she can do that. Her husband gets home from work after a long day. He's tired. And he could easily say to her, Honey, I don't feel like having people in this evening. But once a week, once a week, there's a home Bible study going on there. And I don't know over the years how many people have been baptized into Christ as a result of her using her talent to arrange Bible studies. Do you know that each one of us should have within our hearts a desire that says somehow, somehow, I've got to get this truth, this gospel of Jesus Christ, I've got to get it out to those that I love. Well, maybe you're sitting here thinking, how do I develop that desire, Bob? Tell me what the scriptures say. Developing the desire that Jeremiah felt within his bones. I just don't feel it. Well, may I give you one or two scriptural suggestions there? First, when you see other people, maybe they are coworkers, maybe they're people at the plant, or at the office with whom you come into contact. Maybe it's the next door neighbor or somebody who lives close to you. It may even be a member of your own family. Do you see them for the soul that they really are? Do you see souls? 
You know, the Bible teaches that when God created man, he, he created man out of the dust of the ground. But until God breathed into that man the breath of life, he didn't become a living soul. He was just flesh and blood. But when God breathed into that man the breath of life, there was something special about him. Something not true of the animals. He became what the Bible calls a living soul. Now, in this auditorium today, however many there are of us here, that is how many living souls are assembled here together today. Do you see that? When we pass people on the street or we drive by them in our car, we are passing souls that are going to live forever. It's not just a temporary physical life. There's more to it than that. And Christians see that. We get that because the Word of God teaches us that. It is a little bit like the wise man in Ecclesiastes said, thou hast put eternity into their hearts. Christians understand that these things, these decisions that we make day to day, these little things that occupy us in these physical lives for a few years really aren't what matters. It is looking at it in view of eternity, pondering eternity. That will help us to develop the desire to be a soul winner. Or maybe we need to focus on loving the lost. Loving the lost. Let me read to you the Great Commission, Matthew 16 and verse 15, from the English Standard Version. Listen to this. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Now watch this next verse, verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Folks, when I think about that verse, if, if that doesn't put into my bones the fire that Jeremiah was describing. Ah, I'm not sure what would. Think about what Jesus is saying there. He's saying that their salvation depends upon it, upon believing the gospel and being baptized for the remission of their sins. Their salvation is at stake. Do we love the lost? Or are we too concerned about our own needs, our own desires, what we're doing, what we're choosing not to do, to realize, hey, these are precious people for whom our Lord and Savior died. Or maybe this, think about what it would be like if for some reason, God forbid, you could not any longer tell people about Jesus Christ. You couldn't preach the gospel or teach the lost in a home Bible study. I knew a preacher one time who loved to preach. But later on in life, he developed a throat condition that prevented him basically from doing the love of his life. He couldn't preach anymore. And I thought, how sad, how tragic that is. I'll never forget years ago when I was still preaching for the East Side Congregation in Baltimore. There was an evening, and I think it was a Wednesday evening, but I'm, it was, I'm not sure, it was a Sunday evening or a Wednesday evening, that for some reason I was delayed in arriving to the church building. And I pulled into the parking lot. Seems to me it was getting dark. And as I parked my car, I could hear the singing inside of the church building. And I realized, I thought about that for a moment, 
what a tragic thing it would be to be outside and not able to get in, to preach and to teach and to encourage one another. We studied in our Bible class this morning from Hebrews chapter 10, three let us statements. And if I could just paraphrase it this way, the, the Hebrew writer says, let us first of all, make sure that we're saved. Let us secondly, make sure that we stay saved, keep the faith. And thirdly, let us encourage others to be saved. That sums up the Christian life, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be terrible if we could not do that? The rich man, Luke chapter 16, you remember him? The rich man and Lazarus, both of them died. And the rich man was in a place of torment and realized that he was lost. And notice the request that he makes beginning at verse 27. He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that, and he's speaking to Abraham now, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus, that poor beggar, remember, that was now in a place of rest. I pray that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. Why? For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place, into this place of torment. What was his concern now? Was his concern now about his job, his career, his car, his stock portfolio? Was he concerned about the meals that he was going to be eating out at a restaurant next week? Was he concerned about his lawn, his hobbies? He was concerned about the lost. Even when he himself was lost, he realized after the fact, he said, I've got five brothers that are still alive. Send Lazarus back there to warn them, lest they come to this place too. And then we have Abraham's chilling reply. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. This apparently occurred, this incident apparently occurred before the New Testament age because the gospel was not yet in place. But they had Moses, that is the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's saying they've got the Bible and they've got the prophets. Would he not today say, they have the Bible. Let them read the Bible. Let them hear that. And you remember the rich man's reply, no, Lord, but if, but if someone came back from the dead, they would listen to that. Abraham says, if they would hear not Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Isn't that interesting? And chillingly true. Folks, if people are not converted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're not going to be converted by anything. Wouldn't it be sad and terrible if all of the books were destroyed? We had to rely upon our memory. Wouldn't it be terrible if you lost your voice? Or maybe I was uh, overcome with some debilitating disease serious, and I could no longer teach the lost. Think about that. God has given us precious few moments. Your life is but a vapor, James says. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We must have that fire in our bones to reach out to the lost while we can. Am I getting through to anybody? Let me see if I can focus this even more. 
Because if you walk out of this auditorium today, one year after a personal evangelism seminar, and are still not convinced that you can be a soul winner for the Lord, that you can ring it out, ring it out, if you're still thinking that's for somebody else, let me see if I can draw this down to even a little more personal level. Number one, picture what success will look like. I know that that neighbor of yours is not a Christian, but picture what it would be like if they were. Picture what it would be like if you could teach your husband who is not a Christian or your wife or the friends that you are in contact with in your workplace. Just think of that for a moment, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, lay personalities aside. Somebody says, you know what, I, I don't really like Rob Whitaker's book. I would prefer to do it. So, okay, whatever book works, just make sure you are using this book, the Word of God. Take the personalities out of it and just focus on Jesus Christ and His church. Thirdly, pray. Are we praying I know a lot of you are praying every day because I, I hear about our prayer list and, you know, I get people come to me and say, Bob, you know, you had such and such name spelled wrong. And when I was going through my prayers yesterday, I noticed, you know what, I appreciate that. that tells me you're reading that. You are praying. When you do your daily Bible reading, you might try taking your prayer list. It may be folded in half there. I know you get it online, you can't do this, but you're old school. But for those who are new school, take that and fold it in half and put that right with your Bible. And as you're reading, stop and pray. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for the lost. Pray to God that he make me and you better soul winners. And then that leads us to the fourth suggestion. Personally, if I can't do something, I want to seek assistance from someone who can. I've got some gutter, it's about four foot of gutter that has come loose on a high corner of my barn. Anybody out here do that work? If so, please see me after services. Somebody who's not afraid on a high ladder with some yellow jackets flying around. <laughs> You come see me because I need some assistance. Now seriously, folks, if you, can, if you feel like you cannot do this, then grab a hold of somebody who can. Let's go. This is personal. And then start. Try. You will be surprised what you can do. You say, I never thought I could do this. Yes, but you can. Don't be like that one talent man who said, Lord, I was afraid. I hid it in the ground. Here it is. Remember what the Lord's reaction to that was. No, you can do it. This is personal. And then finally, if you have started and you are working and that person isn't here this morning that you've been teaching and you're thinking, oh man, I'm just not getting, don't give up. Never give up. Remember Winston Churchill's commencement address. Three words repeated three times. He said to that graduating class, never give up. And then again, never give up. And then finally, never give up. And then he sat down. They're still talking about that speech today. Personal evangelism. Do you have it? Like Jeremiah had it? Is it there? Picture where we're going for Jesus Christ. We are marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. And we've got that fire in our bones that wants to bring as many others with us as we possibly can. If you're subject to that great invitation this morning, would you lay aside that which would hinder you and keep you back 
and step into Jesus Christ in obedience even this morning. Would you come as together we stand and sing?